I'm Howard Hale with the Horseman's Corner, bringing you useful information from people involved with the world of horses. I'll be back with today's guest right after this. As always, we want to draw your attention to our websites. Horsemanscorner.com has a slew of content, longer interviews, past programs, horses for sale, video, all kinds of fun stuff at horsemanscorner.com. And also, thank you to Nelsina Lehman for hosting the Horseman's Corner for Howard Hale. Today we have Bobby Blankenship. Let's listen in. This is Nelsina Lehman sitting in for Howard Hale. I have with me a longtime very dear friend of mine, Mrs. Bobby Blankenship from Montana. And welcome, Bobby, and thanks for joining us. Oh, you my pleasure, indeed. Tell us how we, tell us about you. Well, uh, I came to Montana when I was 19. In the summer of 1963, I worked for veterinarian and uh, in Hard Montana, and I loved that job. It was just uh, right up my alley. I didn't have any specific training. All you had to do was be a good worker, and you'd get directed into well, what you needed to do. So then that's where I met my husband later that year. Well, it was almost Christmas. Moved out to his family ranch on the Three Forks of Reno Creek in, in Bighorn County, Montana. In the meantime, I had ordered uh, the Morgan Horse magazine, tried to find out the lay of the land for getting a Morgan. I had a little Toyota station wagon, and we drove over to Aunt and Uncle's ranch. And Uncle John said, Bobby, would you like to drive out and see the mares and foals? I'm like, boy, I practically crawled over him getting in that pickup. Prior to that, I thought, you know, I might have to go all the back, go back to Vermont to find a Morgan, because that's where they came from originally, the mothership. <laughs> um, we were driving around looking at this mare and her foal and that mare and her foal, and, and Uncle John had the window rolled down, and I was just kind of gawking around like a big dude. And, and all of a sudden, I turned and looked out the window across my uncle, Bob's uncle, and there was that little face. And it was the color of a chocolate bar and a brush, <laughs> white hairs across her forehead like it had been brushed by a powdered wing. So I said, Uncle John, I want to buy that filly. Well, of course, when you want to buy something, it's just the one whoever's uh, on the other end of it, that one of the ones they wanted to keep. And I think they finally, after quite a while, accepted the fact that I had to have that horse because I was going to keep camping on their doorstep until I did. Anyway, I got her. That was powder wing. And let me tell you something, Nelsina, you know this can happen. Some horses are horses. Some others are life-changing experiences, and that was powder wing. Amen. Yeah, yeah. And then two years later, I had a little baby boy at the time, and Anselma had told me about the Lehman family over southwest of Ecolaca, Montana, kind of down toward the corner, southwest corner. And I called up and asked if I could come over and visit with them and see their horses. And they were the most welcoming, kind-hearted, joyous people. And I am so happy to say that descendants of that family are still among my bestest, best of friends. And that would be you, Nelsina. <laughs> God has a way of putting people where they need to be. I reckon that's true, because it was just like magic, and we did have some good times together. Anyway, um, Powder Wing, uh, I got her broke to ride, sort of. Not like we do today, believe me when I tell you, and I'll give you a story to back it up. One afternoon, I said, Bob, you and Marvin, that was the fellow that uh, started her, Marvin Lay from Glendive. And he started, he was kind of the cowboy of that country. People took their horses to him, and he always had a line off of horses. And anyway, um, might have been about four by then, and I, Bob came in the kitchen, and I said, look, Bob, these are your kids, too. You and Marvin ride Powder all the time, and I never get to ride her. So you're going to stay with these kids this afternoon, and I'm going to take Powder for a ride. Well, taking a horse for a ride, you don't have to come back because there's nobody calling you on a phone or anything. You can stay out as long as you want. So I started up toward the other end of the ranch, and I uh, encountered a... It was about eight miles from our home place to the end of the, the south end of the ranch. About halfway, I came across a 
young cow that was all but blind with pink eye and a calf that could hardly see at all. And I thought, oh boy, what do I do here? But I, I, I tell you what, Powder was a cow horse from the day she opened her eyes on earth. And we managed to ease that pair through these badlands up and down the coolies and, and cut banks and everywhere else. Got her up to the other end of the ranch where there was a corral. And I, I stopped them where I thought they would stand for a little bit and not try to leave. And I rode over to open the gate. Well, Powder's education hadn't included opening gate from horseback, but I never gave that a thought. So I reached out to open this big old heavy gate, and she looks at that and does a complete 360 faster than I can tell it. And the only reason she didn't fling me like a Frisbee was she got back under me and stopped. <laughs> I must have, That must have been quite a vision, flying me like a kite and then coming right back underneath me. So anyway, I got the cattle east into the corral and rode back home and told Bob and I said we need to gather up the kids and some pink eye treatment, which I knew how to give from my veterinary days. And and uh, yeah, that was that was my <laughs> convincing day with Morgan. <laughs> they would just do anything for you, <laughs> but some of them needed a little more riding and introductions to certain procedures before you tried it out in the hillbilly van. The maiden voyages on horses are always entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. But she had been ridden, Bob and Marvin had ridden her quite a little, but they hadn't, you know, I think to his dying day, Bob would still get off and open a gate. And I'm thinking, why would you do that when you got a horse? Why would you put <laughs> pedestrian around with a gate when you could just teach them how to get you up there and open it and close it? As always, we want to draw your attention to our websites. Horsemanscorner.com has a slew of content, longer interviews, past programs, horses for sale, video, all kinds of fun stuff at Horsemanscorner.com. And remember, if you need anything website related or need help with your website, please contact us at HailMultimedia.com. You can find it right there on Horsemanscorner.com. Now let's get back to our program with Nelsina and Bobby Blankenship. I got another story about that. I was riding a powder colt. He wasn't a colt at the time, but he was one of her sons. And we had gathered a whole bunch of cattle, and Bob wanted them counted through, at least the cows. And so he said, get on the inside. So I opened the gate, let myself in, closed it without getting off. Very smart ass, you know, and these guys sitting there wondering why I didn't get off and open the gate. Anyway, so I positioned myself, and I counted them, and I did the best job of counting I ever did in my life. So when the cattle were all through, I opened the gate, rode through, closed it, and Bob says, well, how many? I forgot. I completely forgot. I was so busy being proud of myself and my horse, I just completely (laughs) forgot. How's that for a good hand? (laughs) Oh, man. They should have branded me with stupid. Oh, Oh, no. Yeah. Well, Powder, Marvin showed Powder Wing in a little show up at Circle. And I was sitting up on the uh, stands with my friend Rosie, who was Marvin's wife and was my best, best friend until she passed away of cancer at too young an age. Anyway, (laughs) Marvin was riding her. People had a lot of respect for Marvin Lake as he, he... did well with these horses. And there was, they were waiting for the reigning class, and I saw a real fancy kind of paint horse ride up, and a kind of a guy that looked like he really was knew, knew what he was doing, because there was a lot of amateurs at that show, too. And they were good hands, but there, you know, there is a difference between an amateur and a professional in some cases. And, and uh, Marvin rode in on Powder Wing and just aced that class just aced it, had her neck out in front of her, then dropped her hindquarters and slid a mile, and and uh, I still have the trophy from that class. Uh. Yeah. We didn't do much showing, but a, a little bit here and there. And uh, the kids grew up on Morgan's powder. Uh, after that uh, show, sometime after that, she got cut in the hind leg really bad, and 
it came really, really close to losing her. But then she recovered, and we never rode her again because she was skimpy on that hind leg. It was right in the hawk, which is one of the worst things that can happen. And um, I started breeding her to the stallions that Aunt Selma and Uncle John had. The first ones that they had were from um, Nancy Rote, R-O-T-T. Her dad, Carl Rote, was an editor, maybe the owner of the Sheridan Press down Sheridan, Wyoming. And Selma liked a flashy horse, and these horses that they had were pretty gaffy and lively. They were really good at what they did, but I, I like a quieter horse. I like a business-like horse that's not thinking about himself, you know, and and uh, prancing around. And they started breeding to stallions from the Jackson Ranch of Harrison, Montana, which is a program that started, I believe, in 1820. Mr. Jackson uh, had a lot of Morgans and raised driving horses and and uh, other uh, versatility purposes. And uh, so we started breeding powder wing to them and then to another stallion that they, you know, through the years, two or three different stallions, and we always got really nice horses. Let's see. That's what, quite a program to have been started in the tw- 1820s. It, it, it absolutely is. And Bill, uh, there were two brothers, Dean and Bill, and Dean showed horses, and one horse that was so notable was a horse named Senefield. And Dean showed him in cutting in all sorts of different classes and and won consistently, and he was also a judge, so he was really into that aspect. Bill, the other brother, uh, wasn't as interested in that, in leaving the ranch, and, and uh, he just stayed there. And, uh, let's see, what year was it? Like, 68 Bill, uh, Dean Jackson was killed in a tractor accident. Bill took over that program and just ran it until he died at 96. And it's time for a quick break before we head into part two. You're listening to the Horseman's Corner. Do you need help with anything website related? Hale Multimedia has been in the business of helping customers just like you for over 20 years. We're not going anywhere and we want to help you best way to get a hold of us is by texting or calling our cell phones and those numbers are on our website at hailmultimedia.com that's h-a-l-e multimedia.com welcome back to the horseman's corner with nelsina lehman and bobby blankenship okay continue miss bobby with your story so i got started with that that family and we were very pleased with the offspring that family of the stallions, and um, we've been able to keep it going because uh, at that time, and this is my life, we had the Big Sky Morgan Horse Club here in Montana, and I, I had some really good friends in that club, and, and like a lot of local clubs, local meaning Montana, the advent of the uh, internet just killed them just flat killing them. Wyoming doesn't have a club anymore. I find it not near as satisfying as getting together with a group once or twice a year, sharing a meal, everybody visiting, talking about their horses. You don't get that online. So that was a big loss, but I was able to retain some friendships. And one was with uh, Dave Williams at Harlan, Harlan, Montana. M River Morgans, and I asked him one time, what's the M River re- represent? And he said, we're right up here on the Marias River. We're close by the milk, which is Mosquitoville, USA, <laughs> and, and the Missouri. So that was a prefix that he chose. And by that time, I had chosen True West for my horses. Um, I just wanted to my prefix to represent that we were genuine ranch type horses and not not that there's anything wrong with show horses western pleasure horses but we were something different we were the pure quill from carried over from the old days when morgans were very very popular before the uh, onset of the quarter horse so dave lives up in harlan montana and he had a son of 
Dean Jackson's horse, Senate Field. His horse was Mortana Senator, and you could spot him in the dark at two miles and say, there's a Morgan. And we all loved him. And I was able to lease a mare by that stallion. She was a bay mare, and I needed a bay mare to, because I, I had a young Carmelo stallion at that time, and I had sold him, and I wanted to breed a mare before he left, which was a part of the deal. And uh, we, we didn't, uh, I was able to lease this mare, and I had her for 12 foals. And boy, did she put me in business. Her name was M. River uh, Satin. And we always called her Silky because I thought that was her name to start with, but I was wrong. But, oh, she was such a wonderful horse. And most of our mares here are her daughters by Smokey. And um, they're just the best do-all horses. Well, back to the old ranch. It, there wasn't, you know, Smokey was a stallion. Bob didn't like the breeding program at all. He hated it, and he was difficult, but that was his approach to life anyway, so <laughs> he, had, he had pretty well mastered that. But I didn't give it up, and, and uh, um, people started calling from different areas around the country and coming and buying. We didn't raise more than, uh, most we raised in one year was five, and uh, they found homes right away. So Tell me about Smokey, Bobby. Oh tell tell the world gosh. about Smokey. How many years do you have on this call? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I um, got to the point where I wanted to try a different cross, a cross with different stallions. And so I found, a, a, actually, one of my cousins told me about a place at uh, Moorcroft, Wyoming, which is northeast of Gillette. And so I went down there and looked at the horses. First of all, this lady had sent me pictures of all her stallions and little packets of information. And so I placed them there by one, two, and three. And when I got down there, I went three, two, and one. So you always want to look at a horse before you sign a agreement for a breeding or anything. And, and, uh, I read that this horse that was raised out in California had a pretty fancy pedigree, and he looked like a Western horse, and that's what I was looking for. And so um, uh, I powder wing to him twice and got two, um, two really, really terrific geldings that they took us through two and a half decades of cow work and and I could talk about them all day. But when I bred her to the California horse, I got a red sorrel filly that became Smokey's mother. And by then I had heard about a little black stallion farther down in Wyoming or out in Wyoming over by Shoshone. So um, I nabbed one of my daughters who was living in Casper at that time. That was John and Elfina. And we drove over to Shoshone and looked at this stallion. He's just, he wasn't a big horse. He was, oh, he'd have to take a big breath to be 14-3. But I bred him to the red mare that Powder had, who was two years old at that time. And I asked my dad, I said, is that is that too young to breed a mare? He said, not if you take real good care of her. So, okay, I'm going to take advantage of this. And the first foal she had on a morning in May when the weather was just getting really, really nice and sweet, out in the back corner of the horse pasture, I went looking for her. I think it was a Sunday morning. And there was this little black hole. Looked mm. just like Will James' pictures of Smokey the cow horse. <laughs> that, was, that was Smokey. And um, he grew up on the ranch. And when he was three years old, a friend of mine mm. told me about a young trainer down... Uh, at Black Forest, Colorado, and so he started Smokey for me, and he called me up one time in the afternoon. I happened to be in the house. Bob had stopped in for a cup of coffee, and, and he said, Bobby, you got yourself a cow horse. <laughs> and I said, well, that's not real news because that's what I've been doing since 72, but um, I'm, I'm really excited that you you find that in him. We rocked along, and then he and his wife came came to visit at the ranch and brought Smokey, and then took him back. And 
In 97, I got word that the Canadian National Morgan Horse Association was staging a show, the Canadian Grand National Morgan Horse Show, and they were having Western classes. They had called me about it and said, what, what do Western people want? And I said, well, we'd like this and this and this. And uh, to show people that you, you can do just anything you want on a Morgan. It's not just talk. And so I called up Robert and said, pack your bags, we're going to Canada. And it was in Regina, which is just almost due north of Glendive, where we lived. And uh, I had a friend out in Washington, Nancy Case, and uh, we had been in, t in touch on the phone. And I said, Nancy, why don't you drive over here and go on up to Canada with me? Okay, so she did. And we just had the best time. And Smokey, the, the class that people remember was freestyle raining, and it was at the end of the afternoon or, or late afternoon of a certain day. And so we chose Boot Scoot and Boogie for our music. And I talked to the guys at the sound table, and I said, when, we, when my horse comes in, this horse at such and such a time, and, and uh, can you please crank that music? And so they did. And they kind of lit up that coliseum. And then we, we had chose, I think it's pattern 10. It's a run-in pattern. Do you remember that, Nelsina? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so am I correct on that? I think, yes, I think you are. It's been a while, but I think you're absolutely correct. Well, he came in like a whirlwind, because all you had to do was just touch your calf muscles to his sides, and he would take off like a rocket. And people couldn't believe it. He was just tearing down that arena, and then he slammed on the brakes and slid about a mile, where his nose was practically at the end of the arena wall there, and then did the rest of Pattern 10. And people were just screaming, coming out of their seats and screaming, and they had never seen a Morgan do it at this level. And, and although there had been very competent rainers at the Grand National in Oklahoma, he wasn't the only one. But he was the only one these folks in Canada had seen, most of them. And you know what, Nelsina? They still remember that. I had an a Internet conversation with a, a young horse, uh, well, we were all younger then, 97, good grief, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, from Canada recently, and she said, I remember that, Bobby. And you know what else? It got to be evening, and Smokey has always loved to roll. So I took him out of his stall, which he was very patient with, but my horses are not inside horses. He was patient, but he hated it. <laughs> and, and so I took him back to the arena to let him roll. And up above the grandstand, a light opened up in a doorway. So you could see the shape of this door. And there was a man standing there, and he was clapping. <laughs> <clears throat> it's time to take a break. You're listening to The Horseman's Corner with Nelsina Lehman and Bobby Blankenship. We'll be back right after this. If you have a horse to sell or if you're looking for a horse, go to horsemanscorner.com. If you want to list one for only 10 bucks a head, you can list your horse with pictures and video on a website that's promoted on 22 great radio stations from Portela's, New Mexico to Great Falls, Montana. It's easy to list your horse, so go to horsemanscorner.com. Horsemanscorner.com and either list your horse or if you're looking to buy, go to horsemanscorner.com. 